Uh, well, welcome everybody. My name is Ashley Heather, um, the founder of The Spur. That's the place that you're in today. Yeah. Thank you for coming and putting up some of your Saturday afternoon for us. Um, I'll just be super quick, so for those, because there's many new faces here, uh, so thank you for bringing the panel. Um, we're a co-working education space, so you might have heard of WeWork in the press over the last five or six years, built out in cities. We're kind of building a space not far from here, and this is our temporary home until about Memorial Day, and we hope to be moving into the new space. Oh, nice. But the idea is combining co-working, where people move, moving people out of their home offices into an integrated environment where they can work with other people. Um, and then we provide in evenings a lot of seminars and education about new topics, whether it's Bitcoin or artificial intelligence or the future of media like today. Um, we, we've had about 60 events so far in this space, so we have two or three weeks. There's a lot going on. In fact, today we have three events. This is the first of three just today. Go ahead, um, give a plug to the other two. So there, no, no, no. <laughs> This is the best one. We'll start with the best and then... Um, well, that was so, good anyway, so, so Bridget and I connected maybe six months ago through The Independent. Obviously a great uh, news outlet here, growing, doing some exciting things. Jessica and some of the team here. Nikki, the back, um, and they've been fabulous supporting us, trying to get our message out about innovation and what the Spur is all about. Uh, so thank you for that. And we thought it'd be great to have a little panel today um, to talk about media. You know, something we all consume, we all know about, but it seems a bit fuzzy as to kind of how it's consolidating, changing, whether it's television or uh, you know, radio, internet, or social media, and so forth. So uh, it's going to be a fascinating panel. And stay afterwards for for a drink or a snack and meet some new friends would be great. Uh, so thank you again for coming, and I'm going to hand it over to Bridget and her wonderful panel. Thank, thank you, you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks so much. Uh, so I'm going to do a little introduction of um, what we're going to be talking about, and we're, we're going to have introductions down the line here. And then it's going to be mostly a conversation, and we'll have some time for Q&As as well. This is uh, somewhat casual, as you can probably tell by my notes, uh, my copious notes. Um, so anyway. We have here people representing books and publishing, television, social media, podcasting and writing, and the magazine and publishing world as well. Uh, it's been, and, and me, of course, I was like, oh, I don't have someone representing newspapers or radio. Well, that's me. So first of all, we'll just do a little, um, do, do, do you know what the word stichomathia means? Anybody? No. Stichomathia? Yeah. Yeah. One, yeah, you know, you taught me. <laughs> Stichomathia is one of my favorite words and one of my least favorite things. It's when you go to see a play, it's an ancient Greek term, and everyone has one line down the road. You see it very commonly in children's plays, bad children's plays. So someone, you know, will say, it looks like the door is locked. And the next person says, let's ring the bell. And the next person says, oh, the door is open. And then it goes back to the first person. So we're going to do a little Stichomathia to start us off, but I promise you that is not the format. So first of all, to, I'll introduce myself. My name is Bridget Leroy. I'm managing editor of The Independent. You guys can follow my lead on this, like how long it is and whatnot. Um, I co-founded The Independent in 1993 um, and was the culture editor and president for the first, I don't know, six years or something like that. During that time, I was lucky enough to uh, be recognized uh, by regional and national organizations over 40 times for journalism and editing. Um, I co-founded the Children's Museum of the East End, CME, and um, I'm just trying to think what else. Do I need anything? Oh, and I, I co-host a radio show on uh, WPPB Sundays on the East End with Bridget Leroy and Alex Socolow. It's on tomorrow at 11. And so that's my background. So it's newspapers and radio, and now I pass it to Emma. Can you scooch back just a yeah. tiny bit so I can see these people over here? Perfect. Thank you. That's great. Hi, everybody. I can do that because I'm her stepsister. Yes. <laughs> Full disclosure. She was an easy ask for that. So. Uh, I'm Emma Walton Hamilton. I'm here representing books. Um, I've been uh, in the publishing industry for uh, 22 years now, but my background is in theater. My husband and I uh, moved here full time in 91. We founded the Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor and ran it for 17 years. And during that time, um, I began co writing children's books with my mother, who is the actress Julie Andrews. And together, we've now written over 30 books for children of all ages and uh, also collaborated on her first and now her second memoir. And I also independently published uh, a book about children literacy and getting kids reading. Um, I currently also work, well, for the last 10 years now, since I left Bay Street, I've been working for the Creative Writing MFA at Stony Brook Southampton. And there I'm in charge of all things children's lit. Um, so we have a year-long certificate program for people who are interested in writing for children. We have our summer conference 
uh, workshops in the summer, and uh, we also have an educational outreach in area schools um, that brings writing, various writing disciplines and writing programs to middle and high school students. Thank you. Angela? That's great. Uh, my name is Angela LaGreca, and I am currently the creative director at LTV, uh, which is our public access channel that serves East Hampton Township. It's based in uh, Wayne Scott, big, great studio. Uh, I've been in television for a very long time. My background was, I was a government major and I thought I was going to law school and then I became a comedian um, after singing at weddings because that's what happens when you sing at weddings. <laughs> you go into comedy and, and I was a working performer for a very long time. I opened for Joy Behar, I worked at The View as the audience warm up, I was the head writer there. I left The View to go to the Today Show with Meredith Vieira as her producer and then I couldn't perform for a while and, and I had a great time at the Today Show and then I worked at her show. Uh, and Sirius Radio, and then I worked this past year at Daily Mail TV, which is a syndicated show. So I've done lots of different things in writing and producing. Excited to be out here. I've had a house out here for 15 years. I always thought I would be able to work a little bit out here, and then it happened. So um, I'm going to be talking about television and the changes in that. And you are an Emmy Award winner. I am, I guess. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she said Julianne, did you didn't say yeah, Emmy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Producing. That's great. Vanessa. Hi everyone, um, mine's fairly short um, compared to um, previous ones, but my name is Vanessa, I'm the founder of East End Taste, it's an online publication that I actually started as a blog about four years ago now, and it started, you know, just for fun, just, I, I'm a, a journalist and a teacher that came in here, out here from the city, and I really didn't know what I was going to do with it, and it just blossomed into now this, um, you know, social media platform with quite a mega following, and it just it's growing daily. And um, other than that, I have two young children. I freelance write for a number of the publications out here and in the New York City metro area. And I do do tutoring on occasion, not as much as I used to, because I have a one-year-old son now as well. And um, just keeping busy uh, do, doing writing and managing the website. And and your Instagram account, which is the really fascinating. Uh, yeah, the Instagram account. It was first. It was the Facebook one that was growing at a steady pace, but net the Instagram. Um, you have approximately how many followers? I think right now uh, forty six thousand somewhere. Okay, so that's. <laughs> and let's move on to Kara. Hi, I'm Kara. Kara, sorry, Kara Westerman. That's okay. Um, I do so many things. Um, I'm a fiction writer. Um, I teach um, writing, uh, but I like to call myself sort of a fearless leader of two writing groups out here, which meet every week. Um, I write for the East End Beacon, and my great love is my podcast called Phantom Hampton, which we have cards here. Um, so that's what I'm doing. So she's here to represent the podcast world and then we come finally to our one male our alpha beta male <laughs> Bob Crozier. thank you Bridget it's exciting to be here uh, my name is Bob Crozier uh, I've spent almost my entire career in uh, print related uh, publishing uh, but I've spent my last 30 odd years living in London so I've been publishing very well-known uh, US titles but on the international side of the business, meaning outside the United States. Uh, I started with uh, American Express Publishing in London uh, about 30 years ago, as I said, uh, publishing Departures Magazine, which was a travel magazine, luxury magazine for uh, back then gold card holders. Uh, I then progressed to be president of Time Magazine, so I ran Time Magazine in Europe, Middle East, and Asia uh, for a number of years. Uh, then I went, for my sins, went into venture capital, <laughs> investing in media in the late 90s, did a startup, um, sold that in 2000, right at the height of the bubble boom and burst. So, um, then became managing director of Forbes International Magazine, so again, running Forbes outside the United States and all the territories. And then finally, uh, most recently for the past couple of years, running Robert Port Magazine, which is a men's, U.S. men's luxury magazine. Uh, and then I moved back here. So I'm now back in uh, Springs, East Hampton, uh, as a consultant, working in a number of publishing areas. Well, that's wonderful. And I did want to point out, if you didn't get the common theme here, everyone here is a, a, just about a full-time resident. Everyone here is local to this area. Maybe not local in the sense that 
my husband's local, like not phonic, but uh, but local in the sense that everyone is pretty much a full-time resident of the Hamptons. Um, so I am here to represent newspapers and radio, and um, but we're all, it's all, like I said, it's gonna be just a, a, a conversation because there's been some really disturbing trends in the world of media as of late for those of us who are in print media or publishing. Uh, we've had the demise of two major giants in the past few months, of, or even though we have Village Voice and just a couple of days ago, Glamour Magazine went out of business. The Voice, you know, in full disclosure, has been a website for the past year or so. But these, this is just the middle, I was gonna say the beginning, but the middle of what will probably be a lot more uh, print publications, um, publishing houses having to either consolidate in order to stay alive or go out of business entirely. So um, to me that's a very interesting subject because we all have to change the game in order to stay afloat. So we're going to discuss what some of the biggest changes have been over the past 10 years. We're going to talk individually about how do you stay current in your particular medium and how to monetize and how to build the next generation of readers or listeners or watchers. Um, so that's my first question and anyone can jump in. Um, you know, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in your medium in the last five to 10 years? Um, and anyone can jump in, I wanna hear from everybody. Who wants to lead off? <laughs> <laughs> I will, I guess. Uh, well, with television, I mean, it's not the way it used to be even more than 10 years ago where it was appointment TV and somebody had to do that rabbit ears as we know and you know, <laughs> yeah, what's gone channel four? And it doesn't work like that. It hasn't for a long time. I kind of, I actually think that television has in some ways mimicked what happened in the stand-up comedy world in the 80s where all of a sudden any restaurant with wood chips on the floor and a stand-up microphone could turn it into a comedy club. And all of a sudden cable, when cable changed everything, then there were so many options. So what are we talking about today? People are not watching TV in a linear way as they used to. We have access to our iPhones and streaming and all of that has changed everything. The whole game is different. And you also have not just television stations competing to create content. You have big corporations and you have all kinds of, you know, over the top, you know, we've got Hulu and smartphone and choices and bundles. And so it's very confusing and it's also very exciting but it's it's uh, it's changed a lot because just the way even the way radio has changed. You know, we don't listen to music the way we used to. We can you know download it and make our own our own Spotify list. We want control, so people want to be able to control what they watch, um, and they want to, I guess I guess you know, do it in their own time when they feel like it, and they're getting that option. So I, I'm not meaning to interrupt, but it's yeah. interesting because Bob and I were having that exact discussion just before we started about. Bob, would you like to riff off of the control yeah, issue? Yeah, absolutely. And, and let me just begin by saying um, the, in the newspaper and print business, like TV and all the other media, has, has changed you know, beyond recognition during my uh, nearly, again, 30 years of being in the business. Speak up. Most importantly, Sorry, you know, and, and as I'm sure you all know, you know, most of that is due to the to the advent and success of Google magazine, Google, sorry, I wish it was a magazine, Google, <laughs> and, and, uh, and Facebook and all the other social media because that content is effectively free to the user, uh, supported by advertising revenue. Um, but back to Control. your point, yeah. uh, I think the future, I, but you know, I'm a little bit more optimistic than your presentation, you know, your, your initial comments there. Yes, print is dead. There's no question about it in the sense that we met it in the past. But I think it's seeing a new life now. And, and part of that is very much gonna be due to how much the user takes back and takes control. But with a big caveat, they gotta pay for it. So paid content is the key. And surprisingly enough, I mean, even though most media, certainly <coughs> online media, print media out, and print media, even out here in the East End, as you know, there's so many free publications. Paid content, uh, New York Times, great example, three million paid users. The Guardian in the UK, which you may not know, but The Guardian's got one million. 
So it is possible. I mean, those are those are big numbers. You know, those are pretty in interesting numbers. And then along with that, of course, there will be there have to be other revenue streams too, which we can go into later. But but I don't. I, I think print's going to survive. I really do. It has well, there to. are always those people who are going to want to sit down. I, I thought about on the way here. It's like crossword puzzles. That's something that you can't do on a Kindle. You know what I mean? It's, it's, so there are always going to crossword puzzle on my phone. Oh, yeah, you stop can. it. You just blew my Sorry. curve there. I do um, the New York Times crossword puzzle on yes. my phone. You do? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm so impressed. I wouldn't even know how to start doing that. But there are, and, and, and if I can just, I don't want to be the only one talking here, but it, you know, Jessica Mack and, then, and I are at the Independent and Nicole, wherever Nicole is. And I think that small town news is different than the, the big grand dames that you're sure. discussing. People want to know who died, who, you know, what team, what high school team won, who got arrested, and who sold their house. So small town newspapers are very different from big, big time newspapers. Absolutely. So I think that small town newspapers will always have a life as long as they cover the trends in a very microcosmic way, if that makes sense. But let's go on and talk about how, again, how this, how the changes you've seen, because yeah, books I, is, and, and, I mean, podcasts are something brand new. You said blog, I was like, I had a blog, but I'm like, blogs, those are so new and newfangled stuff, but talk about books and publishing. Yeah, so publishing obviously has, has been experiencing the same kind of seismic changes as, as other forms of print media and as television. Um, and I would say the biggest changes obviously is, is uh, the advent of electronic publishing and the way in which we consume books now through our Kindles or through our iPads or whatever you know uh, service we download audiobooks and, and um, audible books and all forms of electronic publishing. Um, there's also been this big shift towards independent publishing, even now um, hybrid publishing, which is a, a sort of a new format where the, com the traditional commercial publisher partners with the author to, cre to create a kind of a hybrid version of independent and commercial publishing together where the author either foregoes in advance or puts in some of the funding for the publication process. Um, so there's all sorts of different models happening. There was a time when the industry, not too long ago, several, just a couple of years ago, the industry was crying, you know, print books are dead and um, lamenting, you know, the loss. We'll never see, everything's going to go electronic. We're all going to be reading electronic. Um, interestingly, uh, because I'm in children's publishing primarily, I sort of had the sense that that wasn't going to be the case because particularly for younger children, the actual book is always going to be preferable. It's always going to be something that teachers use in the classroom. It's always going to be something that parents and grandparents and caregivers prefer to sit down with a child and actually have pages to turn and actually have that tactile um, and emotional, emotionally connected experience, um, which is hard to duplicate electronically. But, but it's actually now, um, suddenly in the last few years, we're experiencing a resurgence of interest in print. I think people are experiencing a little bit of electronic reader fatigue. And um, independent bookstores, I'm sure some of you have seen recently in the, in the newspaper, independent bookstores are coming back with a resurgence. Just when we thought everything was going you know, to Amazon, um, it seems that you know, people are starting to really value their community bookstore again largely because they're reinventing themselves. And I mean, my own Sag Harbor bookstore, you know, has a, a tea, uh, Dobra tea, Dobra tea bar, bar right. at the center of it, you know, and, and other uh, creative events there. So I think bookstores and libraries in particular have, to, have had to redefine themselves, but they're not dying, absolutely not dying. And print is not dying. Um, if anything, it's becoming more valued and more cherished and it's being thought of more as an art form. It's less commercialized. Uh, it's, 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 it's actually kind of having a new, in many ways, a new heyday now. Um, but not without, not by itself. Now it's print and the electronic version yeah. and the, you know, and the, audio, the audiobook version. And so you just have to think a lot wider than you used to. And authors have to take, whether you're traditionally published, whether you're independently published, authors have to take much, much greater responsibility for their success, for their marketing all of that now. Um, back when we started, it was, it was basically, we write and they publish. Now, you know, you can't even hope to get published unless you bring your own marketing plan to the table, your own social media following to the table, your own ideas for marketing, and so forth. And that's, 
that's a whole different side of the business that didn't used to exist. Well, that's so. you're bringing us right to uh, Vanessa Social media. And, Cara, and Cara. Um, in particular, let, if I can lean off with you, Cara, to talk about uh, podcasting yeah. and you know how how you kind of got into that and how yeah, talk about that. Well, it's surprising <laughs> to me that you know podcasting is radio, and so no one could have predicted that in this day and age people are gonna are getting addicted to listening to the radio. And I've done this since I was a child. I used to listen to all the old radio shows that they had brought back. Um, so my theory is that people don't, don't have enough hands and eyes. And we're looking at so many screens, and somebody somewhere said, oh, but we could put headphones on and we could listen to something. So in this simultaneous world, that was sort of the last frontier, and now it just, it seems so crazy to me how sped up the world is, and podcasts are also, if the story-driven ones, the really beautiful ones, not the Oh, speaking ones. of listening, <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. They actually give you a lot of space to stop and listen, and um, they're actually the antithesis of what you would think would become all the rage. So. Um, I got into it because I studied oral history and I started collecting people's stories and I started editing those together. Um, and this is almost impossible to monetize because everyone, it's free. <laughs> so I'll talk about that later when we get to that. Right, so. right. Um, and Vanessa, you've been nodding your head and I'm sure you've had a time to formulate a thought or two. Or sure. I mean, pull, pull it off of what everyone said so far. I mean, definitely with, particularly with children's books, I, you know, encourage my daughter to read actual books. I think I'm very, very fearful, honestly, which is kind of sounds a little ironic for someone who's you know running their social media accounts, who now also has assistants helping them running their social media <laughs> accounts. It's quite it's quite a project and it's a, really a 24-7 job job that I'm on now. But anyway, I digress. So when I'm walking around East Hampton where I live with my daughter and she sees Book Camp, um, yeah, Book Camp, Book Camp, still called Book Camp, Book Camp, and, and she, I encourage her to walk in, and we buy, we have so many books at home, but we buy a, a book each time, and I'm so proud of her for picking up a book, choosing which book she wants. I don't want her scrolling through a phone or an iPad and be glued to that, because I am, like I said, fearful of how often, I mean, I was reading an article the other day that the average time that ch children under the age of 12 spend on the social internet, or it's like an, an, an hour, 90 minutes a, a day? I said, where do you, uh, that's all? That's okay. all I know. I, know. I, 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 I felt like saying that hats all. Supposedly adults on average spend two and a half hours. Uh, but, um, so, pull off of that, I want that exposure to that, that you know, you, you holding books, you holding print material. Personally, I'm sick of looking at a screen all day. I force myself to put my phone away, to put my tablet away and focus on my children, focus on, I have, you know, National Geographic, I have um, other publications sitting on my um, coffee table at home, and I read them, and I love to read them, so I agree, I don't think print will ever die, I, and I hope it, and I hope that's the case, and I really encourage people to pick up print. Well, I'm going to start with you at this time. How do you stay, because you are sort of the the golden child here, even though you might not feel like it, but because you do what everyone else here would probably really like to do, which is you have a very, very successful social media platform. And it's beautiful, by the way. If you go and visit her her Instagram account, all the photos are beautiful. They're, they're in focus, which mine aren't always because I'm taking them, but you really have managed to stage yourself. And we didn't talk about the Hamptons Influencers brunch yeah, as well that you, that you host. Oh, that's right. I did this big um, event this past summer. Um, it was really, honestly, just going to be a 15-person sit-down networking luncheon. Mm. That was it. But I have two close friends of mine who are event planners. They're like, we could do something. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what do you mean we could do something? I'm not, and I'm someone that does not like to be the center of attention. I, I'm kind of, no, I like to be on the, the behind the scenes, so to say. So that was scary, you know, I'll be honest, very scary for me to host an event, but um, everyone loved it and we are doing something again next year, whether it'll be out here or in Manhattan, we're still deciding, but we will do it. Well, let's, let, but let's start with you, Vanessa, and then we'll go to everybody and jump in again. But with Vanessa first, how, because 
she does have this amazing Instagram account and all the photos are so beautiful and they all are sort of the same color and I know that's that's part of like the algorithm that's now discussed. East End Taste. East, East End, end taste. taste. Yeah, no, we can't. yeah <laughs> East End Taste. And um, how do you stay current? Because you are in the fastest changing of all of these. Oh boy. It is, it is something. It's a world of its own. Um, you have to be on top of your game every day. You are the uh, performer now. And it definitely is something where I leaped out of my comfort zone. It's not just you know, like I was saying to Ashley, like a nine to five job where you show up, you do your work and you leave. I have to be, so to say, on call every single moment. If someone comments on my photo, if somebody writes something to me, messages me, I have to answer them right away. I do not have notifications on my phone. I don't want to be that attached to it, but I have to check it, you know, you know, I'm, you know, at a certain time each morning, a certain time each evening, I have to be responsive to people. I have to be approachable to people. I have to also be uh, aware of different personalities, different opinions. Um, yeah, I have to be very open with people and um, be aware of that. But in, in terms of how it's changing, it's, we're cha it's changing every single day. Um, the biggest thing now is how to monetize it. And I started monetizing my account about a year and a half ago. If you were to have told me four and a half years ago when I started this fun project, and that's all I wanted it to be. Um, my daughter was about four months old, and I said, I'm just gonna start a website where I just write about, I like food, so I'll visit the local markets and food, and I said, whatever, this is fun. <laughs> but I started to get into it. I started interviewing people. I started going to restaurants and li listening to the chefs, and I was, I'm, and I am genuinely interested in what they have to say, and it formed and formed and formed. And I created uh, the Instagram account in particular to coincide with that. And I said originally, oh, I'm, I'm not getting involved. No, not interested. Uh, but I did, and it, here, here it is now. Um, but in terms of monetizing it, that's, I can get into that a little bit later. Well, we're going to talk about that sure. later. First, I just want to talk about how you stay current in your medium. So you've, I think you've covered that. So 24-7 thing for you. You have to be on, on top of it. You yeah. have to be ready and able to perform at your top standards because those those people that are that are following me they are expecting top-notch content i have to have photographers ready and i work with about four photographers on a regular basis um i have to make sure if my husband's doing they say the the husband of instagram if he's doing it he's actually actually getting kind of enthusiastic about it now like today we had to do a photo and he's no, I think so. It's, it's quite a well, and, it's quite, and I'll, I'll jump off you because you're reminding me. Of course, is at the Independent, which is sponsoring this event. By the way, um, we have we do uh, we do an actual newspaper. Then we have someone who throws everything up on the web. Then I take that stuff and do Facebook schedule Facebook posts, maybe forty or fifty of them sometimes in the summer, to come up throughout the um, throughout the week because you don't want to overload people and we are we've always been a free paper so this is all free and then we have an Instagram account we have uh, social media stories it is overwhelming if one person were to do it um, it's it's quite a lot to get kind of across all of the different um, platforms and then the radio show which is NPR it's WPPB um, you know people go oh I missed it so what do you do so I actually I mean, this sounds so self-serving, and it really isn't. It's because I want the radio show to survive. I mean, public radio is, is that I started a BridgetLeroy.com. Don't go look; it's really embarrassing. But I really did it just <laughs> to have a, a, a landing site where we could put the radio shows so people could listen to oh, the radio cool. after, which is, I guess, is the same thing as which leads into the podcasting. But Ed, but that's how we. I mean. We stay current at the Independent, and how I'm trying to, as a new person, we just did our tenth radio show, trying to stay current and get kind of NPR up but there. What, but, but let me ask you something, because when you say stay current, I'm in, I'm understanding you to mean like how do you yourself stay current? I mean, in, in the in, industry, like you just talked about everything the Independent is putting out. But what do you have to absorb on a day-to-day -day basis to stay current as a journalist? If I absorbed it, I would be a nervous wreck. I was just kidding. <laughs> we don't throw it just work, 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 work. Right? Just, <laughs> as, a, as a journalist, God, you're putting me on the spot. Um, as a journalist, um, it's a very hard time to be a journalist right now for all of media. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for Ashley to even uh, bring up the future of media right now. Um, we are being attacked from all sides right now, and, and uh, journalism especially, and, and it's 
you know, I, the, the good news, and again, Bob and I were talking about it before, oh no, I wasn't, I was talking with Alex Otto about it, is that since, um, you know, there's been all this concern about fake news and, and Russian collusion and all of that, the, the New York Times and the Washington Post have like tripled the amount of subscribers they have. <laughs> so, so it's maybe had a little bit of a boomerang effect, but it is very difficult. And as a journalist, I don't, as an editor, I can say something, but as a journalist, for me personally, thanks for asking me, Anne, I appreciate it. Um, I, I bring to the editors, I am managing editor, but I bring to the publishers stories that I find to be important and current and speak to my heart. So I was lucky enough this summer, for example, to interview Serge Kovaleski, and you can go and see it on the independent site if you're really interested. I say Serge Kovaleski, no one knows who the hell I'm talking about. Right. If I say the mocked disabled reporter, everybody knows who I'm talking about. Yes. So I was able to interview him. Wow. Um, you know, and, and to me, that was a very meaningful uh, interview. I'm about to interview someone else whose who's, um, brother was uh, murdered in Russia in 2004 for being a journalist. So I kind of get to sneak stuff in, um, but it's not through my voice. It's, uh, it's an uneditorialized, unbiased interview. I'm interviewing you, tell me about that. But I kind of get to sneak, you know, kind of get to sneak it in that way if, uh, if the publishers are willing. But let's go back to you guys. So it's how, thank you for bringing that up. So how do you stay current in your form of medium, in your form of media, and, and how do you stay current, and how, does you keep, how do you keep your medium current? Angela, Cara, or Bob? Because <laughs> Emma and me and... and, and well, Rosa. I think, let me just I see. Oh, you haven't said anything yet. I'm a little, you know, I'm a kind of once removed from you active people, but, but I do try and stay current, obviously. And I think, what you need to do is try and stay focused on a few key things. One is, you mentioned sustainability. How do you keep your business model current and sustainable? Um, the other one, for me anyway, this is not a, applies to everybody, but I think independence as much as possible, and that's kind of a general word that can be defined in many ways, I realize, but go, along with that goes credibility. and. You know, again, it goes back to this you know, fake news and all the other things we know about. If you focus on those two or three things, you know, then it makes it a little bit easier because you can't know everything. But if you know that you, those are your core principles, then you can go back and reach out to people that you do know that can help you with the, the technical part. At least that's the way to look at things. Because on the technical side, I'm, I'm not that kind of person, but I, I do like to keep you know, the credibility and the independence and, sustainability of the projects that work with, you know, on track right. for obvious reasons. Right, okay. Um, anybody else want to jump in? I'll jump in. I think, I mean, it's interesting what I'm hearing, what I'm just realizing we've all been talking about in terms of what's happening in media and what the, what we're sort of moving towards is this, this idea of curated material, right? What we all want now is curated radio, curated television, content. curated content, right? And staying current, I think, the only way to do that is to have your own curated process of, of you know, the way in which you stay current and get your information. And um, you know, in in the in the larger publishing industry, you know, obviously there are the still the the main sort of sources of information that you kind of have to subscribe to Publishers Weekly, at least to their weekly newsletter, and just kind of skim and see what's going on and who's doing what, and who's moved where, because it's such a it's an industry with such a rapid turnover rate. Literally every week, some editor is moving from one house to another, or becoming an agent, or something. You know, it's just it's moves at the speed of light. And um, but for me personally, ironically, one of the ways that I stay current is, um, and I have to stay current because I also teach writing, and so I'm responsible for all these mm -hmm. aspiring writers who are looking that's to me. That's my last question. <laughs> but, but that's you know, I'm I'm responsible for providing them with a with an accurate reflection of what the writing landscape is. So. Um, and ironically, the way I stay current is through teaching. Not necessarily through the MFA program, but I have, I started out um, being part of a weekly mastermind group, just with a, a, just having a weekly conversation with a handful of fellow writers, and once a week we would just get on, the, on a mutual sort of webcam site together and talk about our individual projects and support each other and our businesses. That grew into two outcroppings. One is an annual children's lit conference online 
in which that we host that we've now done for five years. And how many did you have last night? Like so we have 700 people logging in from all over the world. Um, but the best part of it is that we then bring in keynote speakers and guest presenters and agents and editors and so forth. So we're learning as much as our attendees are. And the same thing is true, another colleague of mine in this mastermind group, we started um, a submissions uh, course, an online program to help people with their submissions to publishing houses, to agents and editors and so forth. Now we have to keep that content current. Right, and as I just said, the turnover rate in the industry is at the speed of light. So knowing, you know, giving people a place to go where that information has been curated for them, what the latest submission guidelines are, what the latest formatting guidelines are, all of that, um, is now part of my job and is right. and is also helpful to me in terms of my own work as a writer. So and I, I meant to say also because Emma asked me a question. You guys can all we can all ask each other questions. So if someone's saying something you want to riff off of it, you don't have to sit there with your yeah. hands on your lap. And, oh no, we're not, not for the audience yet. We we'll, we will do that. But but I was gonna yeah. say how um, how sort of tired I get of people. Um, you know, saying, oh, the millennials, they're always on their screens. Uh, these, these, this younger generation, they're addicted to their screens. I really, I'm really angry about that because the screens are how they're making money. And so people looking at it from a different angle. I mean, she says 24 hours a day, her way of monetizing and making money is to be on call. And it may be horrible, but so, you know, when we see people doing this, the tendency is, I, I think, in the older generation to make fun of them. And I'm like, they are working. Well, <laughs> speaking of screens, just quickly, I want to go to Angela because you are public access and yeah. on TV. So explain, yeah. you know, how does that well, stay current? It's very challenging. And um, it's challenging. TV in general is challenging because there are so many options and, and so many. It, they call it the digital disruption. You know, all the, the presence of the digital uh, TV is a disruption to the way we're used to seeing things and producing things. But the idea is to really take the disruption and figure it out. So how do you figure it out here? Now with, with, with regular, let's say regular TV, you have advertisers. And so you have to now get metadata and collect and see what are the viewing habits and how are people, what are they watching? What do they want to watch? And try to create niche programming for them. And in some ways you could say that applies to public access, but the inherent core of public access is it's free TV that we're providing for you. So how do you monetize that? You know, we don't have enough money to do everything that we want to do. And then, and the concept is also hard for people to say, well, well we should just have this access. So what do we do? You know, and I think, and I'm trying to figure that one person who's, you know, you know. And you're a recent yeah, addition and to new LTV. Thing, and, and it's challenging because so, 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 and I've done some research and just some of it is instinctive and also, I, you have to work on programming that people really gonna wanna see and, and also empower the public to create their own programming. That is the beauty of the digital disruption is that I can take this phone, like Soderbergh, and make a movie out of it if I want to. It may not look like his movie, but, so, but that's, it's, so there's a beauty, as I guess what the point is, there's a beauty in that anybody could do a show on LTV if they take this class and then, Anybody could do a show. Yeah, you know, and, and, you know, and so and some of those are great. And so, what do you do with that? You, know, you right. want to have people to be able to have their voice. You want to honor the local community, and at the same token, you want to be able to have things that people are going to go to. Now, they're not watching in the same way. So, we have to. What are this? You have to make your website better. You have to. People have to be. They say right away. Well, if I can't see it in East Hampton, I'm not in East Hampton. Can I? Can I watch it on the internet? Right. So you need to make all of that video on demand as accessible and good as possible. You have to try to create programming that's going to make people say, I, "I have to see that," rather than just see anything else. You have to, you know, you have to try to collect data, and that's very hard when it's not even, at, you know, because you know. So it's very, it's it's interesting, but you can collect data on, like we have Facebook uh, where we put things on, or we on, on, on YouTube, we have an East End Underground show that mm -hmm. honors all these musicians, it's really well done. Right. And, and so, but you try to create more programming like that, trying to see who's watching when, trying to then, you know, reach out and get people to underwrite <laughs> series and say, you know, like, you really love cooking, you know, right. and oh, so we go and try to co-partner, and we can't say, you know, 
a big heavy-handed advertising thing like go go shop at you know whatever. But you can say written, brought to you, you know, written, uh, underwritten by or brought right, to sponsored you courtesy, by, sponsored by. Yeah. And that's the challenge. And I, I really am excited. The thing is so funny is I've, I've worked at so many shows where I mean five million people, six million people would see my little five-minute segment on the Today Show. There was great value in that. This is not the same number, <laughs> but I have to say that my excitement about it is equal, if not more. Why is that? You know, I think because there's so many fascinating people, and and I love the East End, and I truly, truly do. And so my feeling is, it's not about all those other numbers. We can still create something valuable and wonderful. I've seen something on LTV that was like a really good uh, film about human trafficking. You know, and and yeah. that can be broadcast elsewhere. We can make things go viral if that seems important, but we can still create content, and it can disseminate into the world. So the very thing that threatens traditional television and other forms of media can also be the solution, you know? And I think we need to figure out how to use that and not be afraid of it. I was thinking what you're saying about, yeah, you know, I have a five-year-old daughter, don't ask me because it's very complicated in my life, but she is on that, you know, can I watch her, her YouTube social? And I push books and she loves books, but I believe you have to honor people who are older and not shun people or who are young just because they're young. Well, there's also, a value in both. I'm sorry, because yeah. cause also, because Cara has been doing the oral histories, and, and I want to also lead to the idea that we were talking about, about artificial intelligence and algorithms, Bob is going to talk about, but first, the, the the honoring because you two are so similar with that with, oh, you know, with right. your podcast. I, mean, they, I think you I mean, have to be around young people. I mean, I know it's just a lot of times because they do. I mean, and it's not they're all not just little brats, but that is the wave of you know. I mean, some of them are. But <laughs> anyway, it's true, and it's annoying. But it's but it's 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 nothing worse than like ah, that, that generation. You know, like you can always learn. And I think you have to honor older people too. That's right. the problem is that they're the it's viewing, the, the, viewing pub, the, the people who watch like public access are traditionally 65 and older and they're not giving people. They don't donate <laughs> and they really don't. And they're loyal. The, right. the people who donate are people who, who, so it seems, get interested in something like a series that they, then they feel and they don't watch even consistently. So I have to find those people you know, and, and, and say, hey, can you help us? Because we want to be able to create more and better content. It's not that we're, gonna, we're not capitalists in the sense that we're going to monetize this and make them, you know, tons of money at public access. We want to do the best that we can. Well, so anyway, I don't know if I got off track. But. Um, Phantom Hampton, it, it, because I got so tired of seeing the same two artists covered in every magazine every summer, yeah. I thought I was going to lose my mind. And uh, <laughs> it, it was, I'm not going to say the names, but I mean, I mean, wow. No. So I'm trying to find uh, the underneath the real Hamptons out here. Yeah. So we have, um, so far I have 12 of them and um, I'm trying to do what people don't generally think it's like to live out here. And also, it's called, wait, it's called Phantom Hampton. Yes. Stories for the, how the oh, rest of us Oh, stories from where the rest of us live. Thank you. She's okay. Louise, you don't give the full title. I, know, I didn't even say the title. Good marketing card. Yeah. Nice. Uh, <laughs> but what I was gonna say is 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 going back to that thing of being on the screen all the time. I mean, if you're in this business now, you have to monetize yourself. And so that brings me to Patreon, and that brings me to this new level of how people are monetizing themselves through donations. Right, which is a, the Patreon is a platform for podcasts and publishing for everything, for everything where you can there ask for donations. There are people making you know, half a million dollars oh, yeah. or 100000 a month on Patreon. So, And then Bob has all these notes. So <laughs> you came more prepared than all, I did. They're not all for this. <laughs> They're not all for us, um, but you were. We were talking about artificial. You were talking about the disruption, yeah. digital disruption, and that's what we were talking about before uh, before we started. Tell me a little bit about how you yeah with the raw report and everything along the same lines. About what, what's what's interesting about the future, I think, you know, in terms of the good part, as opposed to God, are we going to ruin our children because they're going to be on the screen all day? I, th I think there are two areas to, to watch. One is, as we say, artificial intelligence. It's both good and bad. You know, artificial intelligence, for those who don't know, is machine learning. It reads everything that you're reading. It feeds it back to Google. Then Google sends you that ad because it knows you know you're going to go to. That's how I got my boots. Yeah, I wrote right. boots, and then the, I had an ad for boots on Facebook, and, and it's like boots. And it just continually <laughs> learns more and more about you, and it's a it's a terrifying thought. 
to many ones. And, and for me, as an older person who grew up reading newspapers, it, it, you know, the whole idea of serendipity and learning something new that you wouldn't have wanted to know about before, that, that's completely lost, you know, that, that, you know, turning that page and seeing an article about something you knew nothing about and then it'll become, you know, become interested in it is, is one of the great joys of life. So that's lost. On the other hand, if you combine some of this new technology, like artificial intelligence again, with say virtual reality, which is another thing that's you know gonna be it's gonna be big. Big. <laughs> and what will happen with virtual reality is our children back to that might have grown up, but the years who are younger, will be experiencing almost as if it's real things like nature in Africa uh, from <laughs> their chairs in East Hampton or you know, underwater sea life, or you know, make it up. So you know, there's a lot of, and and I think that that dimension of that extra dimension of and, content, of content, and how it's applied to all of our media is going to be incredible, absolutely fascinating. I don't know how it's going to play out, but it certainly has enormous benefits on the education side alone. Um, that, that I, I just. We can't even imagine. I'm well, it's sure. also being used in medicine. Now. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, all sorts of yeah. Things. I mean, all kinds of things. So I think you know, the, the, it it's there's good and bad to everything. Yeah, you know? it's so true. Yeah, I, I think about that all the time because, you know, I, on, a, on a car trip recently, I had three kids in the back. Two eight-year-olds were like. If, you know, they're on their phones, you know, like playing their videos or singing to Jojo Siwa and everything. And then finally the, the, the battery died. I was like, thank God, you know. And, but the question was like, what did you do when you didn't have, and I'm like, oh, you didn't have cell phones when we were kids. You know, you start, yeah, 99 bottles the hell of beer there. on the wall. But you know, what did you do? <laughs> yeah, we fought the war with cannonballs. You know? what, what, did, what, did, what did you do? Like you know? I yeah, like yeah, exactly. Like, we used our things. imagination. You know, I started fun. But, but then I thought like, I was angry about some of, some of that because it's changed, and just the way there's a loneliness to life, okay? And 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 all of this interactive and connectivity and Instagram connects people in a way, and and I think that and and gives us information that's amazing. But the very thing that allows you to find your shoes in two seconds, or we don't have to go to the library to look something up, you know, we can. We're so empowered, you know, and we are, and that's a great thing. We can shop on Amazon. We can do all these things. We can watch something immediately, and then. Somebody can organize and you know take down a, a building, you know, I mean, because they, they can quickly do that. There's going to be good and bad, like you said, to everything like that. And I think that the issue is really what is the overall goal? What are we trying to do in our respective medias? You know, it's not media and entertainment is not going away. In fact, it, it, it's almost 800 billion dollars is going to be spent on it. You know, right. in the next, it, it's not going away. It's really more about what what is the good and what is the the. Not the right thing is the right thing to say, but you know, what are we trying to achieve and how can we embrace that well, technology? I, I mean, I think that's really the challenge. I think that we have um, questions actually already from, from the yeah. audience, so if you, we can jump in there, we can continue this uh, Let's conversation. Open Let's open it up. Are there, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Sort of was brought up because when you were talking about how you keep um, up, being updated and up to date on what's go going on, you have to be with young people. <laughs> I have three children in middle to late twenties. Okay, so I can tell you, they all cancel their Facebook accounts, but they're all on Instagram. They all live alone, but I mean by themselves. None of them have cable. They all have Netflix. You have to realize what's going on and to, to put the val and they all listen to podcast. Who who would have thunk seriously? <laughs> That that would be for me. That was real. But they drive the car. If somebody lives in LA, they drive the car. It's a long time. They have their own podcast. Podcasts are fantastic. I listen. I would have never even thought about doing something like this. But I think this. And so, it's not just in media. The guy. My name is Nadia Ernesto. So I have a sauerkraut company. Oh, I just friended you on Facebook. Facebook? Yeah. <laughs> so, Seriously, like an hour. So I have this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I made from it. It's a small business. How many people have ever said that? I, 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 have I, am, I am a crowd. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because less people said that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I have to, um, and I was, you, you change with the times, you know? 
Kathleen cookies we Kathleen were just King. talking about. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you start small, yeah. you go to Whole Foods, you open, you know, a big factory, bring in investors, you go for world domination of China. <laughs> but Whole Foods right. priced itself for the small company out of the market. This is not the market. She didn't have the online ability to sell online. They didn't have Amazon the way we do. So you can stay small and you can market that, you know. It's a whole different story. So you change with how people how people shop. That's how you sell. Yeah. So it's the it's across the boards, whether it's yeah. video or um, sauerkraut. 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 <laughs> how about the business world? Like, what's the money flow? Who's making money? Who's losing yeah. money? What's where's employment? Who, you know, what, each one. Kind of what's what does that look like these days? And you can start. <laughs> Cars. You know, the newspaper. You can start with the newspapers. Uh, newspapers um, well, news, we are, we, we are not the norm at The Independent because we have always been free. So we were delivering free news way before free news became a thing with the internet. Um, so it is a question of, of moving now to um, events. Is, is that what you're going to say? Events? I'm looking at Jessica Mackin since we work together. Uh, it is uh, the, the world of newspapers, even small town newspapers, and uh, is to host events. You'll notice Maybe especially that small town newspapers. Especially small town newspapers is to host events, whether they're eating events or restaurant events or whether they're events that also have a beneficiary that's a local nonprofit as, as, as partially uh, dividing the spoils. Um, but it's also the and monetizing. Is that because you can charge for events. More? You can is charge for point? events, but you can also say you have hold an expo, like say the, the, something where you are charging the vendors to be there. You are advertising it in the paper and on your website and on your Facebook account and on your Instagram account, and then you charge say a, a, a cover charge for people to come in. That's a way to monetize for, for newspapers now. And actually, and I will give a shout out, uh, no one does it better than Dan's Papers out here. And they get a, a large stream of their revenue. I'm not outing them. This is the way Except it is. The rumor is that it's on the, it's on the block to be sold. Don't know about that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, but yes. Dan's has been sold again and right. again, and then Dan He's buys it back. But, uh, but the, the other way is with banner advertising. And we still, you know, people still want to pick up, like I said, with small town newspapers, people mm -hmm. still want to pick it up. They want to see the picture of the mm. car accident. They want to read the obituary. They want to see the kids' team that just won the state <coughs> championship. Um, and they want to see the deeds of who sold their house. And that so will always be current. Less employees is the nature of employment. No, but my point is, is that we can still get advertising right. in print for small town newspapers, which perhaps the larger newspapers people are turning to more internet or, or, or something along those lines. But we can still monetize by advertising. Monetizing? Uh, I mean, if you want to make a lot of money, don't write a book. <laughs> is that, unless you're lucky enough to hit it rich. I mean, to you know, to get a six-figure auction deal for your book it's um you know i guess what i will say is the fastest growing sector financially in the publishing industry in terms of you know the, the biggest money makers right now both for the publishers themselves and also for authors is young adult um that just that is outpacing adult fiction and every other form of, of publishing that there is um largely because so many adults read young adult as well um, and because middle graders will read up to young adults and so forth. So that's, that's the hottest niche in publishing right now, but for individual authors, I mean, the one thing you always have, as I mentioned earlier, is this opportunity to explore self-publishing, independent publishing, or some sort of hybrid variation of that. It's not for the faint-hearted. Um, having d done it myself, um, you know, it takes a substantial investment up front um, of your own resources, both financial and time. Um, and there's a number of different ways to do it, but the but in terms of the actual uh, money ratios, it can be very much more attractive. If you think the, the typical average author royalty rate across the boards, whether you're in children's publishing or adult publishing, whatever, is 10%. That means that an, an author, after they've gotten their initial advance, which might be anywhere, it might be $5,000, $10,000, $10, really lucky, it might be six figures, um, but after that advance, that advance then has to earn out. The publisher has to earn that money back before they pay you another dime. And then they only pay you 10% of every dime after that. So 
90% of writers <coughs> never see another dollar after the advance. Um, so self-publishing or independent publishing, hybrid publishing is a solution to that because mm -hmm. you get 80% and maybe the, the other 20 is put into fulfillment and distribution and getting your books out there, marketing and promotion and so forth. Um, but you also have to put out Right, you know, it, to get there. So, does anyone else have something they want to add to that? I do because the uh, Jack Conti, who started Patreon, is a musician and an artist, and his whole idea—I mean, he was getting a million views on YouTube, and he was receiving, I don't know, a few hundred dollars a month. His idea was, what if I ask everybody for their credit card number? <laughs> what could go wrong? They are supporting artists through that platform more than the NEA now. In I think two years they've risen to whatever that figure is. But he's also telling us artists, writers, I don't want to to gamble. I want a steady monthly income. And the way Patreon works is people who love what you do give a dollar, twenty dollars, and there are different tiers because psychologically we don't get the chance to have steady incomes, a lot of us who are working in podcasting or writing. And the idea that um, I don't want to get a huge chunk of money and spend it all and then not know. It, I want a really steady, um, safe uh, thing behind me so I can continue creating. And so Patreon has really become a platform for that's, artists that's and what media. It's about. It is monthly so that the artist gets a monthly steady income. So it's a crowdfunding. Well, well we're going to we're going to wrap up kind of soon and have the discussion, but we have some a couple more questions. I'm waiting for you a question. <laughs> that covers everything that you guys have all been discussing. So, um, Vanessa, I'm kind of excluding you from this question just because I know what you do, and it's kind of backhandedly not against you, but a question on my end as a journalist and someone who's aiming to do what Vanessa sort of does. Um, we're talking about money and we're talking about, you know, authenticity of media and how people follow local news. People follow local people like your local bookstore, local authors, stations. Do you think in today's ever-growing trend of influencers and paid content online, talking about Instagram or whatnot, as influencers rise, do you think that it takes away from the trust of the future of media? So to give an example, and again, I'm not, Vanessa, I love what you do on your, one of your biggest fans, I'm not outing you, but as someone who's on that line where I consider myself a thoroughbred journalist since I was a kid, however, I'm also of the same age as Vanessa and I admire what she does and I see profitable money, real future in that. So you're asking about ethics, this is an ethics question. It's not, it's not so much ethics, I'm just at like, so I know it's ethically wrong for media to do, but in general as the future of media in the discussion, do you think that as people are now getting paid online for their personalities as a trusted source, obviously not people aren't getting it, but do you see the future being paid in that personality, sort of for your content? Anybody want to take it? It's that? a very hard question, but since everyone, it's like everyone's across the board kind of on like different, uh, you know, mediums. Well, I mean, I I don't want to speak for Emma, but I, but I know Emma and I both have our own like emmawaltonhamilton.com and I've got a bridgetleroy.com but I use it again like I said as a landing so I'm not trying to monetize it but it would be really nice if hopefully the monetizing comes organically from people reading my articles and listening to my radio show and then maybe someone will say hey she interviewed Jane Fonda for the independent let's get her to interview Lily Tomlin for Playboy or whatever and pay her 50 grand you know for for so the idea is I guess to create a continuing interest and, and we're talking about it as an individual and I just hate whoring myself I just have to say that um, well, really, I do but um, you know but but it's it but that seems to be what you're talking about in terms of being an, an influencer in the sense that people are going to come to Bridget to get what Bridget has right so as a journalist I get people coming over to me on my Instagram because they don't People don't know them all based off my Instagram. You're also right? like 25 years younger than I am. So. But, that, but this is, but we're discussing the future of media. So when right. people come to me, they all, they offer me on my, in my inbox, very similar to what Vanessa does, except not nearly as, as successful as she is, but they're offering to pay me to wear their brand, to do, to come to their restaurants and do this, and physically offering to pay me. Now, I turn them down because it's unethical as a journalist, but as an individual and across every different aspect of media. Okay. 
Yeah. So very interesting. Tricky. So in other words, the question is, can, very you tricky. can you be someone who monetizes yourself out here holding a Coca-Cola and then will people still trust you to write uh, an unbiased article? No. No. Okay. I would. <laughs> no, 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 no